So what's so interesting is that before most of the, the really bad things exploded in South Africa, Pastor Jim gave this prophecy over South Africa, um, not knowing what was coming. And I want to read it to you. I think you'll be encouraged. He started off saying, there's coming an eruption for South Africa, and there's an eruption of corruption, says the Lord, but I want you to know I am blowing out the corruption for, eruption of my, for, for the eruption of my spirit, and there will come 20 days of intense and terrifying shaking. We can handle that, church says the Lord, and I will shake everything that can be shaken, and I will shake it and break it and take it and expose, and the hearts of many will fail them, says the Lord, and my church will be strong in the, this moment, says the Lord, my church will be great in this moment, and I will say to those in South Africa, pray, for churches will divide over this matter, churches who have lost my spirit, they have become so social, and they will melt down into nothing, says the Lord, for I have raised up the heat of that nation, says the Lord, I have brought it to the boil, can you feel the boiling? For they have cried out, and I have come as a refiner's fire into South Africa. And do not fear the meltdown. Do not fear the closing of stock markets. Do not fear when banks seem to shut their doors. For I am the Lord of the harvest. There is none like me. Yeah. And the intensity of the meltdown will be followed by the intensity of my spirit. For I am coming to revive the prayers of my church. Many will want to leave, but I say cleave. Cleave to me and see what I will do. Cleave to the land that I have graced you with and see what I will do. Even now the banks will melt down. There will be unprecedented freefall. There will be fear on the markets, but I am the Lord of the markets. We didn't have our downgrade then, so you know this was the Lord speaking. There will be fear on, fear on the markets, but I am the Lord of the markets. For even as I gave that nation another chance, even, says the Lord, as I allowed it, they corrupted themselves in their prosperity. Even now I will melt them down and deal with them, says the Lord. I will reveal, I will lift the skirts of those corrupt leaders, for that nation is my nation, not theirs. From the very beginning, says the Lord, I had a purpose for that nation. From the very beginning, it was to be a mission nation. My purpose will span through that nation, and I will come like a burning, refining fire. You are not to be afraid. You are not to lose heart. My purpose for that land will stand and stand and stand. It is greater, says the Lord, than the rand. You are not to fear. It is not in free fall. My hand is on the rand. Watch what I do for. Though it will fall low, it will boil back high. It will even go faster than it went lower. You are not to be afraid. Trust me, says the Lord. Everything is in my hand. Can we give the Lord a hand? I also want to make a prophetic statement over you as individuals and over this nation. No matter what the ratings agencies, agencies say, we are not junk status. We are the righteousness of God. We carry his glory. God is working in this nation. The plans that he had before, he still has. Your businesses, the promises he gave you of your businesses still stand. He knew this was coming before he made you those promises, and he still made those promises. He is able to overcome all of that. There is a glory that this nation carries that is meant to be shown throughout the world. There is a glory that this nation carries that is meant to be exported from here. God is shaking the institution that people have put their hope in so that people will turn and put their hope in the living God. This is the time for the church to rise up. You have a message. Speak out your message because people right now are looking for answers. This is the time when the multitudes will stream to Jesus because the very things that they had hoped to be their salvation have proved false. And right now they are reaching out. They are reaching out for something more, and you have the answer. And I'm hearing the Lord saying, many of the seeds that you have sown are coming to fruit in this time. This is, the, this is a time of fruitfulness for the church. This is the time for the glory of God's kingdom to be evident in this nation. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand? Lord, I pray that as we begin to teach and preach around your word, that, Father God, you would come and speak to our hearts. 
Lord God, you would come and deliver us from fear, Lord God. As that prophetic word said, Lord God, we are not to fear. Lord God, we know who our master is. We know who the king of the ages is. We know who the creator of our universe is. We know the ones who made us, who planned us, who planted us in this nation at this time. And therefore, we are not afraid. We are certain of a bright future. And Lord God, we thank you that you are giving the wealth of the nations to your church. And all of God's people said, amen and amen and amen. Awesome. We are continuing our series called The Price Tag. You learned last week about the price that was paid for you, how valuable you are. I've been thinking about this week, but the Bible says that before the foundation of time, Christ was crucified. In other words, what it's saying is that before God reached down into this earth and put his hands into the soil and molded Adam and Eve, before he even decided to make one human being, he had already looked forward and seen the future and he already knew they would become necessary, a sacrifice for the sin that we would enter into. And before he made you, he already made this decision. I will die so that they can be with me. Here's what that proves to me, that to God, the most important thing, more important than life itself, is that He would be able to relate to you, that you would know Him, that you are more important to Him than anything else in existence. It was more important that you existed Then he lived. That's how he felt about it. And so, God, we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you, Lord. We want to thank you. We want to thank you for the cross. We want to thank you that you made a way. We want to thank you that you made us. No matter what circumstances we were born in, it is better to be born and know you than not to be born at all. And, Lord God, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you that you made us and that you saved us. Amen and amen. Today we're going to be talking about the courage of the gospel, and I want to move to a passage of scripture that because I've been studying it for the last week is now my favorite. I do have lots of favorites, and each time I study a passage of scripture, it becomes my favorite, but for now, this one is my favorite. It's a very famous passage of scripture. It's in Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, but the author was obviously close to Jesus and very profound. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. How many of you have been tempted to grow weary and lose heart? Yeah, I was going to say don't raise your hand, but you already did. You already did. (laughs) We see that hand. We see that hand. But the author of this portion of scripture knew what it meant to be human. He knew that we all faced difficult times. And at that time, there was huge persecution against the church. They wondered if their witness was worthwhile, if their lives were making a difference. They wondered if it mattered that they lived righteously. And like us, they, they, they were growing weary in, in doing the good things. And the author was putting this down there to tell them It's worth it. When you wake up in the morning and you try once again to do what's right and again it's met with opposition and you ask yourself the question, is it worth it? The answer is yes. It's worth it. Every righteous word you speak, every godly deed you do, every um, faithful moment where you believe God despite your circumstances is creating eternal Glory that you can't even comprehend. You matter. Your life matters. And it matters that you do what's right now. It matters that you wake up today and you love that person 
that is difficult to love. It matters that you do the right thing at work. It matters that you speak out against opposition, that Jesus is the way. It matters that when you face difficulties, you rise up with the power of Jesus inside of you and you say, no, I'm called for this. These things matter. These things matter. In 2015, ISIS, you know all who know, know who ISIS is, an Islamic militant group. At two o'clock in the morning in January 2015, they went banging on the doors of innocent sleeping people in a town in Libya and they hauled out 21 Christians out of their beds and they threw them into an unknown, unknown location with seven other Christians who were already there. The only crime was that these men professed Jesus Christ. They were what we call Coptic Christians, Christians from the Egyptian Orthodox Church. And they were in Libya trying to make a living to send money home to their impoverished, impoverished families back in Egypt. And these men were rounded up and they were kept prisoners for five weeks probably under excruciating circumstances. All of them were offered the opportunity to recant Christianity and to proclaim themselves Muslim, and then they would go free. But they didn't. And in February of 2015, they were marched, as this picture shows, a very famous picture, by their ISIS guards in black. They were dressed in orange uniforms, indicating prisoners, and they were marched down the beach in Libya, forced to kneel, and they were decapitated with a camera rolling, and for the whole world to see, the video was put on the internet as a warning for every Christian. Horrifying. I was speaking to a man in the first service who's actually from Lebanon, and he says this was his reality growing up. People professing Christianity died all over the place. What was remarkable is that one of the people that was rounded up with these, these men was not a Christian. Somehow he just got caught up in, the, in the, that moment, and wah, he was... He was from Chad, and he not much is known about him. But he was thrown in with these prisoners, and he sat with them for five weeks. And the day they came to execute him, they said to him, Are you a Christian or are you not? But after sitting with these men for five weeks and seeing the courage in their hearts, seeing their unwavering commitment to a cause bigger than themselves, that they were more concerned with the glory of God than they are, were with their own well-being, after seeing this for five weeks, hearing their stories, listening to their testimonies of what Jesus had done in their lives, this man stood up and he said, Their God is my God. And he was executed as a Christian. Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand. This portion of scripture call, calls and talks about this great cloud of witnesses that surround us. And you know, I've often had a funny um, feeling when I've read the scripture. You know, I imagine myself going into the bathroom and all these faces looking at me, you know, this, this historic crowd of people just watching us. <laughs> Have you ever had that thought? So this great cloud of witness, what does it mean? Are they like people watching us nonstop? Are all our forefathers and the, are they all just sitting and watching our lives? And you know, every time you steal that cookie from the cookie jar, there are a hundred faces looking at you. Well, no, no, no. That's not what this <laughs> scripture is talking about. It's talking about this crowd of people. Witness literally means martyrs, and it means this crowd of people who have ex exhibited extraordinary faith in Jesus Christ that have gone before us stand as an example to, our, to us of what can be done and how we can live. 
And when we see these people like this who fearlessly stand in the face of death to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, what it must do for us is say, it's possible to live for something bigger than myself. It's possible to live for something greater than me. You know, I believe in every side of every human heart, there is a desire for greatness. No person at five years old stands up and says, I want to be a street bum. You know, they just don't do it. Why? Because there's, there's the imprint of the divine on our hearts that yearns for greatness. It yearns for significance. And everyone is, is longing for that. And this scripture is talking about that. It's saying, look at the greatness of all the people that have gone before you can have it too. And I'm not saying that that you are necessarily going to die for your faith. There are thousands of people that went before us so that we could live in a country where our religious freedoms are guaranteed. Praise the Lord. And I pray that none of you will ever die for your faith. I do pray that. But I also pray this, that every single one of you would be prepared to die for your faith if that came to if the, you were faced with that option. I pray that every single one of us in such a situation, we would stand and we would stand and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I cannot deny him. Cut my head off. Do what you will. I will do this. And I pray that that same kind of conviction would stand with us when we stand in our workplaces and the person next to you offers a profanity against Jesus. I, I pray that there would be something that rises up in your heart and declares, no, I know that Jesus, and he's not like that. I pray that we would be the kind of people that unwaveringly would bear testimony and witness to what God has done with us, done for us, unflinching against the ridicule and the scorn that we would receive in return. I pray that we would be that kind of people. That in our hearts we would stand with that great cloud of witnesses and we would count ourselves in. We are those kind of people. We are those kind of people. It says that since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off the weight and the sin that so easily entangles. Those of you who are parents will understand my next analogy. Those of you who aren't, there is fun on its way. But there, there have been times, and this is a conglomeration of a whole lot of things. I can't remember a specific instance like this. But, you know, you walk out in the morning a little bit blurry-eyed. You're heading to the kitchen for your first cup of tea or coffee, depending on what kind of person you are. And you, you're walking through the lounge. You step you place a step and something squeaks under your foot. You notice that you've just stood on a squeaky sto toy. You take another step and the skipping rope that's lying there is, wraps itself around your leg. You try to get your other foot out. As you do, the skipping rope does more. You wraps itself around your leg. Then you trip over the, the blocks that are there and bam, you're on your face. And there, good morning. Or maybe as this picture, you were just trying to fix the internet and that's what happened to you. But you know, we've all experienced times when, when stuff gets in the way and you want, you want to move fast and you, you've got these dreams in your heart, you've got the sense of greatness and you want to move into that great future and yet there is stuff in life that just keeps tangling itself in your legs. You get up some momentum and bam, you step on something and you're over. And it's like this, is that though God is working to bring about that greatness, but that we have an enemy who's throwing things at your feet every day to try and trap you, to try and keep you from fulfilling the destiny that is on your life, to keep you from fulfilling the greatness that you know you contain inside of you, the spirit of the living God inside of you ready to burst out. If I want to paraphrase that first verse of Hebrews 12, I would put it like this. Because we have this example of great faith, let us simplify our lives to keep the important things first and the damaging things out. Let's keep doing what is right until we see results. You've seen the ad 
this beautiful car comes purring down the road. What's that? Um, Chapman's Peak, around Chapman's Peak, beautiful scenery, purring car. The camera angles are such that the, the sun is glinting off. The car pulls around the corner, makes a few magnificent curves. The music is gently tinkling in the background and saying beauty, majesty all over the place. Inside the car is a gorgeous woman and a gorgeous man, and they pull in front of this mansion. They open the door, and they put their foot out, and they're wearing Gucci shoes, and... Ah, oh, and then the caption comes up, you deserve it. You know the ad. You know the ad. And it looks fantastic, but really it's the devil throwing things at your feet. It's the world trying to tell you that that's what life is. But we know better than that. We know that life is Jesus Christ himself. And that to settle for that would be to settle for something so much less than you feel beating in your heart. And I'm not saying you won't have a nice house and a nice mansion and fantastic shoes. We know Mike's already got there. <laughs> I'm not saying that you won't, have, uh, you won't have those things. But what I am saying to you, if you strive to them, they'll become a trap and they will prevent you from fulfilling what's really in your heart. What's really your destiny? What's really gr of great value and what's really true? And one of the greatest entanglements that the enemy throws us is overspending. Really, we run after the wrong things and we find ourselves giving more money than we have to try and get a sense of fulfillment for, from things that can't give it to us. And then what happens, you stand in front of a God opportunity that requires some investment and you don't have what it takes to invest. You stand in front of someone and God says, I want you to help this person financially. And you don't have because why? Your money's in bonds and credit cards and debt all over the place. And one of the ways we untangle ourselves from that is to control our spending and to keep what I like to call or what's been coined, this phrase has been coined by someone else, not me, but to keep a God pocket. So I keep a place where I, I keep money that's, us, that's especially for when God speaks. For when God says, I've got it. I'm ready. I can move. I'm free from that entanglement. The next one is inappropriate entertainments. You think it's just an innocent movie that you're watching. Listen, guys, watch movies. I'm not against movies. But there are some that are going to program your mind to think a certain way. They come with an agenda. There's certain things you can occupy your free time with that are going to go start speaking to you a worldview and a way of looking at life that will become a rope around your feet and will prevent you from being able to do what God's calling you to do. They will speak to you a wrong value system. They will call to you to put your time and energy into things that are irrelevant. They will suck away your available energy and time. And we've got to unwrap those things from around our feet. The next thing is complicated relationships. I know none of you have any of those. <laughs> Recently, I had one that I just had to cut the ties and say no more. You know those kind of relationships. No, yeah, it wasn't Andrew. I'm still married to Andrew. He's, he's, he's the good part of my relationships. But you know those kind of relationships that are just sapping and pulling from you and eating away at your ability to, to love God and do the things that God is saying. The, those relationships that are distracting you from the things you know God wants you to do. I see some girls looking at me wide-eyed. But for all of us, we'd have to just say, so far and no further. You know what we have to do? We have to release ourselves from being that other person's savior. And we have to say, Lord, I entrust that person to you. I don't have what it takes, but you do. Amen. How about some emotional lack? Have any of you been watching or listening to the news? this week. 
Yeah, I know some of you are saying, I listened for the first two days and then I decided no more, no more. But you know what I noticed? Uh, I've been listening to like talk radio a, a lot and many of the people who call in, you know, very valid things they're saying, but every now and then you get this person who calls in and you can hear by their tone and you can hear by the way they're speaking and the things that they're saying that their outrage is not coming from a place of wanting justice. Their outrage is coming from a place of deep pain and I sympathi sympathize with that deep pain, believe you me. But at the same time, some of the things they say on the back of that are sometimes unreasonable and uh, a little bit um, jaded by that pain that is in their heart. And God is going to bring about incredible, incredible victory in this nation. I prophesy that to you. But the thing about emotional pain, the results of abuse and neglect and the difficulties of life that come to make their home in our hearts, what they end up doing is they color the way we see the world. They inhibit our ability to believe God. They inhibit our ability to relate to people. They inhibit our ability to hear wisdom and to come up with creative and constructive solutions. And I feel like one of the best things we can do for ourselves, for our communities and for our nations is to get free on the inside. And you know what? It's not hard. I know you've carried that pain for so long. It feels like it's a part of you. But I hear Jesus speaking into your heart and saying, it's not yours. You don't have to have it. And I want to promise you that Jesus can heal in an instant. I don't care where you come from, what happened. You don't have to live with that emotional pain. You don't have to live with that emotional pain. Because God is a healer and he will reach down into that place and in an instant he will set you free. And then the righteous causes that we go, of can, go after can be, can be motivated from a place of wholeness, intelligence, wisdom. Our ability to craft solutions can be, come from a place of truth, a place of understanding, not from a reaction to pain in our hearts. And guys, don't, I don't want to minimize anyone's pain, really. It's true. It's real. Every one of us come from a past. Maybe you came from an abusive background. Maybe just the, the sins of our nation have affected you. Whatever it is, every person carries something. But there is an invitation from Jesus. There's an invitation from Jesus to say you don't have to be that person that that pain is trying to mark you as. You don't have to be inferior, powerless, angry, rageful, shy, whatever that thing is. You can be a glorious creation of the Lord Jesus Christ, standing in the fullness of his power, able to do what you need to do in a loving and constructive way. If you are battling with complicated relationships and emotional lack, we do every year do something called a Victory Weekend. We can help you and stand with you. You can come to this. We can start you on the process. We can walk with you. We will, we will stand with you until it's done. Amen. Because together we're going to win this victory. I came from a I can see you all reading way ahead of me. I saw that. I saw it. I saw it. I'm just like, I want, I'm a little bit selfish that way. I want you looking here. <laughs> but I grew up in a church that taught this. Everything that's fun is of the devil and everything that's not fun is of God. Did any of you come from any of those churches? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I'm too late, too late, too late. <laughs> You know, I used to wake up in the mornings on Sunday mornings and I would pretend to be asleep even though I was awake so that my parents would leave me alone and go to church without me. And you know, sometimes I would wake up at 2 o'clock or 
crawl out of bed and say, they've got to, they've got to have gone to church by now. Creep down into the lounge. I find them all there and they say, oh, we didn't go to church today. And I was lying in bed trying to be asleep and I'd wasted the whole morning. But nonetheless, I, I, that environment wasn't pleasant. You know what I'm saying? It was like, oh my word, why be in church? Why, why be in a, a religion like this? But Jesus said a remarkable thing to his disciples. He said, these words that I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking so that your joy might be full. Every precept, every word, every law, every scripture of the kingdom is meant to um, corral you, push you, move you towards ultimate, incredible, mind-blowing, soul-satisfying joy. The greatest advert for Christianity is happy Christians. Everything that is right, good, and pleasing is completely open to you in the kingdom. Joy is your portion. Joy is your portion. And one of the reasons we labor at the things we do is because the joy on the other side is so great. You know, I'm a little bit selfish that way. You think that I am kind to you just because I'm a nice person. Well, I, I hopefully I am a nice person. But I'm really kind to you because the joy I feel when I see the smile on your face is so much greater than anything you're feeling. You think I tithe just because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, if that's the only reason you tithe, then do it. But I, or I tithe because the, the joy that comes when I relinquish the control over my finances to God, the relief and the, the feeling of safety that comes to my heart when I say, God, you're in charge, not me, is so life-giving that it's worth it. And so it is true of every aspect of the kingdom. That there is a joy on the other side that cannot be bought. So a lady by the name of Shauna Nequist, and I left the A of her name. I'm so sorry about that. She's not a man. She's called Shauna. And she is the daughter of Bill Hybels, a very famous pastor in the U.S., and it just goes to show that pastor's children rock. <laughs> and everyone at the back said? <laughs> she said this in a book that she wrote called Cold Tangerines. She says this, I want a life that sizzles and pops and makes me laugh out loud. And I don't want to get, a, get to the end or tomorrow even and realize that my life is a collection of meetings and errands and receipts and dirty dishes. And I want my everyday to make God barely laugh. Glad that he gave life to someone who loves the gift. I want my life to sizzle and pop. If you ever come to my home in the evenings, there are two characteristics of my home. First of all, there is very intellectual, interesting conversation, most of which I don't understand. But I have learned the art of looking intelligent even if you don't know what's going on. My children are very smart and stu studying very intricate things, and so I don't always know what they're saying, but I act like I do. So that's one characteristic. The other characteristic you will find is lots and lots of laughter. Because I'm married to Andrew. Oh. <laughs> no, also because Jesus is there. Jesus is there. And there's something about the kingdom that is so full of joy. That joy is your portion. There's joy ahead for us because we're on the winning team. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors. Why? Because Jesus already conquered us, conquered for us and handed us the victory. I don't care how many setbacks you've faced in your life. Really, I, you can tell me that it's been daily 
since the day you were born. I'm telling you now you are victorious in Christ, that your future is bright, that there's success ahead of you. Any failure that you have experienced is not failure. It's simply training for the next victory that is on the way. Guys, I've read, I've read, <laughs> I've read the end of the book. I've read the end of the book. There is, there is victory. We are on the winning team. We are not the underdogs. We're not the hypocrites. We're not the sidelined ones. We are the answer for this world. We carry a glory that is unprecedented. All of the angels sit in wonder when they see us rise up in the presence of God and do the things we do. We're, there's joy ahead because we are shame-free. An interesting thing when, in Hebrews where it says that for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. He scorned its shame and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. When it says he scorned its shame, literally it means he thought against the shame. Yeah. I want you to remember that he was crucified naked and exposed on a cross. I mean, how much more shameful can you get than that? Spat at, laughed at, jeered, mocked, ridiculed on that cross for everyone to see. Completely vulnerable, completely powerless. I mean, if that is not an occasion for shame, I don't know. And yet at that moment, in his mind, he was thinking against shame. He was resisting the onslaught of the enemy's words. You're useless. You failed. You'll never make it. And he was speaking back the knowledge of his father. No, I'm the, I'm the righteousness of God. We can't say this, but he was saying it. I'm the savior of the world. <laughs> He was speaking back his identity. I'm this beloved son in whom my father is well pleased. He was pushing back that scorn and that shame by just repeating what was true. And you and I, faced with our daily onslaught of life, we can be tempted to believe the lies that are thrown in our hearts all the time. You're not good enough. You're not worth it. You'll never succeed. You have no power. This is not for you. Give up now. And we have to think against it. We have to resist shame and say, no, I carry a glory inside of me that is so great. There's residing in me the king of the universe, the creator of the worlds. When I speak his word, worlds are created. Things change. When I stand up and resist the ridicule and the scorn that I'm receiving from those people I've shared Jesus with, there is a glory I carry that is so great and powerful that it is causing their wrong thinking to be conformed to the image of Christ. And last of all, we can experience that joy or we can anticipate that joy because we live fruitful lives. Paul was writing in Philippians to the Philippians and he was, he was saying this to them, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it's better to live or to die. Have you ever felt that? Don't raise your hands again. I will give you opportunity to raise your hands later, but, but you know what he was saying? It's like, if I live or I die, what? In fact, it would kind of be nicer to die, so when you throw those stones, throw well. But the end of this little writing that he was writing to the Philippians, he says this, he says, and yet I choose to live. Why? He says, because it will be fruitful labor. What he's saying is that if I go to be with my heavenly father, I can no longer reach you. I can no longer do these great exploits here on earth that God has given me to do. I will lose out on the many victories that these hard times are allowing me to have. And he's saying it's more important that I reach my neighbor than I go to be with Jesus. 
So if you want to know why you are here today, you are here today so that you can display the glory of God in your workplace, so that the nature of Christ will be revealed there, so you can reveal Christ to your family, so that you can open doors for multitudes to understand and know the kingdom and walk into it. Where do we find the courage to preach the gospel against all odds and in difficult circumstances? First of all, we look to those who have gone before. And we say, oh my word, if they found the courage to do it, we can find the courage too. We remember the consequences of not doing it. This is an interesting quote by an atheist. He's a magician, and I often laugh at that because if you don't have the real power, you have to make it up with tricks. You know what I'm saying? But he's an atheist, and he says this. His name's Penn Gillette. And he says this. I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. That means to evangelize. I don't respect them. I don't respect that at all. Sorry. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling this because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate someone not to proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there is a certain point where I tackle you. You understand that? I just get you out the way. And this is more important than that. Do you feel the rebuke from an atheist? (laughs) What he's saying, oh my word, if you believe something, live by your convictions. If you believe Jesus is the only way, then it is important that you stand up and say that. Because otherwise, what you're saying is, I don't think you are good enough to know and to have eternal life. I don't think you're worth what Jesus did on the cross. We anticipate the joy of what's ahead for us. And we get equipped. On July the 1st, we are holding what we call our REACH training. And what we do is we train you how to have conversations with people, normal, natural, unweird conversations. Because you're going to have to see those people often after that. We understand that. How to have conversations with Muslims, Hindus, atheists. And how to share your faith in a way that's relevant and they are able to receive that. How to catch the the prompts and the leadings of the Holy Spirit in those conversations. Be able to respond to them. So don't miss out on that. Get equipped. Know. Have a tool, an arsenal of tools that you can bring out at the right time. And finally, the scripture talks about this great finish. This great finish that we're all going to receive. You know, I've heard many people say that the that life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And what they mean is don't put all your effort into today. Run at a measured pace so that you can be doing this for a long time. And yes, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Don't burn out in one year. Pace yourself. You're going to be doing this for a long time. But I'd like to just even push that analogy to the side and say, as I was thinking about this, I don't really think that life is a marathon or a sprint. I don't even think it's a foot race. I think it's a Formula One race. And if you want to, you can run it on foot, by under your own steam, trying very hard. You may do that if you want to. But me, I'm getting into the Formula One car marked Jesus. And I am, I am roaring across that finishing line, not because I'm fabulous and fantastic, but because I'm in the right car. <laughs> My husband's saying, I've got the formula that won. But I want to invite you 
to step into that car. Serena on the front is very happy because she's a car fundi. And she said she knew all along that she was supposed to drive a sports car. Now it's confirmed for her and she's fine. You know, a story is told, or let me rather say, I want you to imagine for a moment that you decided to go as a missionary to a small Pacific island. And the people there had not heard of Jesus and they were very antagonistic to the gospel and you went there and you suffered terrible things. You, you battled to have food. You shared the gospel. The people hated you. They attacked your home. You fled in fear of your life many times. But you got one or two converts and you were doing your best. It wasn't spectacular, but you were working hard at it. And you came back to South Africa for a holiday, and as you, as you were flying back, you noticed you were on the same plane as the Blitzbocker. And when you arrived at Oatambo, the Blitzbocker got off before you, and there were television cameras and lights and action, and people asking for autographs and cheering and balloons, and everyone was so excited to see this conquering team, welcoming them home for all their victories. Can't say that about all our teams, but Blitzbocker, I go. <laughs> and after all of the um, parades had stopped and everything had died down, you walk through those two sliding doors with your little suitcase, and it's just deadly silence. And no one's even looking at you, and they're all carrying on with their lives, and there's no one to meet you. And you, and you walk home, you might be tempted to say to God, look, these people running after ordinary goals and me working your kingdom I come home and there's nothing you would hear the spirit of the living God whisper to you you would hear him whisper to you you're not home yet son you're not home yet daughter and I would like you to fast forward to the moment when you have lived your life wholeheartedly for Jesus, stood up for him in every way, been brave and courageous in difficult circumstances, labored faithfully where he's given you to labor. No accolades on earth, no, no, maybe no earthly triumphs. But I want you to fast forward to the day where you stand at the door of the throne room of heaven. And they open those doors and you walk down that red carpet toward the throne. And on the right and the left, there are multitudes of people, multitudes of angels. And there are lights and they're not from flashes of cameras. They're from the glory of God going everywhere. And people are cheering and, the world, and everyone's going crazy. And they're saying, hail the conquering heroes. Hail the conquering heroes. And you feel the accolades of heaven. You feel the accolades of heaven. And I want to tell you, anything we could do to honor people on this earth will not compare in the minutest amount to the glory that you will experience on that day. And before the whole world will be displayed, your acts of kindness, your selflessness when you no one saw the times that you were ridiculed and mocked for your faith, the times that you stood up and said it anyway, the times that you reached out to people, the times that you loved, the times that you restricted your life in order to have resources to give to others, the times that you lived right because of Jesus. And all of that glory and majesty will last for eternity. And you will look back over your life and you would say, those small sacrifices I made, those small sacrifices I made, those small sacrifices I made are nothing, are nothing in comparison to what I receive now. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just love you. Oh God, we want to be courageous and bold people. If you want to be, have more courage in your life, can you just raise your hands? I want to pray for you. Lord, I just pray that, Father God, this, um, this scripture would inspire in us a courage to stand up and be counted as Christians, Lord God. Father God, this scripture would speak to our hearts and would empower us to be more than we've ever been before, to give vent to that glory that is residing inside of us, which is Christ in us. Let us throw aside the things that hinder and those sins that so easily enslave. Let us let them go. Father God, let's stand up and be counted. Father God, come, 
Come and clothe us in power and majesty, confidence, zeal, the power of your spirit to be witnesses, Lord God. Let it be so, Lord. Let it be so, Lord. Let it be so, Lord.